Well, hello once again. It's so good to be with you guys on this week. Uh, I'm excited because we are on part three, the final part of our series titled Baby Monsters. If you have your Bible, we're in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 11 today. And I'm going to be reading quite a few scriptures. Uh, not too much to overwhelm you, but it'll still be more than what you are used to with us here uh, at the experience. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, I'll be starting from verse 1, finishing down in verse 5. Now, if you're just barely joining us and this is your first Baby Monster episode, uh, the baby monsters really what we're dealing with is all the small sins in our lives. Uh, they're, they're the small monsters that if we leave them unattended and if we don't uh, take care of them, eventually they grow up and they will definitely take care of you or take you out uh, much better said, right? And so uh, we are dealing with the baby monsters in our life, learning how to kill them while they're small uh, instead of letting them grow up to be really large problems in our lives. And uh, not to worry, if you have some really large monsters, we have an even bigger God who's able to take care of those as well. So be encouraged. I hope that by the end of this message, you would have gained uh, enough information and enough uh, word of God to put it into application to where you can now go out and slay the, even the babiest of baby monsters, all right? Second Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. Here's how it says. Here's what it reads. It happened in the spring of the year, at the time of when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Amnon and of Ammon, excuse me, and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and the woman and someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and, he's, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house, and the woman conceived. So she sent and told David and said, I am with child. Now, it's interesting because, you know, it's speaking of children, I, I uh, came across a children's book on my iPad a few weeks back, and it was titled, There's No Such Thing as a Dragon. And it's about a kid named Billy who wakes up one day, and there's a tiny little dragon sitting on the edge of his bed, kind of like the size of a baby kitten. And uh, he's surprised. I mean, uh, he comes downstairs, and the dragon follows him, and he tells his mom about this baby dragon, and the mom tells Billy, before she even sees it, Billy, there's no such thing as dragons. And Billy's like, that's strange, because there's like a, there it is right there. It just followed me down the stairs. Now, the mom turns and sees the dragon, but... Of course, she can't go back on her word, so she pretends like she can't even see the dragon. So the dragon starts to grow and to grow and, and instantly almost, and he starts to eat Billy's pancakes. And Billy's frustrated because he's hungry, but, you know, mom's just, the more pancakes she makes, the more the dragon eats. And it keeps, she keeps telling Billy, Billy, there's no such thing as dragons. Like, calm down. So the whole time, this dragon is getting bigger and it's becoming more of a problem and making more of a mess. So soon, this dragon gets so big, it fills up the entire house. And Billy is frustrated, telling his mom, Mom, there's a dragon. And she's still pretending there isn't a dragon. So Billy's like, well, you know what? Maybe if Mom says there isn't one, maybe there really isn't a dragon. But eventually, the dragon gets so big that it picks up the entire house, kind of wearing it like a backpack, and it starts walking down the street. And uh, Billy dad, Billy's dad shows up from work, and his, his house is gone, and his neighbors are, are awesome enough to tell him hey look there goes your house down the street uh the dragon is carrying it down there and so he starts to chase the house and the dragon and as he's doing so he sees his son and his wife up in a window and he's like what is going on and so billy's like it's the dragon and the mom is shouting back no there's no such thing as dragon son and the dad's like i don't know like whose side to take i see it but i guess technically that's true he says and billy at this point is extremely frustrated he finally shouts there is such a thing as a dragon. There's one right here, and it's huge. And as as the dragon is now acknowledged by everyone, it's only then that it starts to shrink down to its normal size. And, you know, the moral of this and what we just read in the scripture is that when you're in denial of something that's clearly there, all it does is get bigger and create more problems. And, and, and it's crazy because, you know, what we read about David— not a lot of preachers like to preach about this because most people would rather hear about David's victories or how he has such a terrible boss when he's working for Saul, right? Because, uh, you know, we like the underdog, and, and David is relatable when he's the underdog because, like, we also have giants to slay, and we also have 
terrible bosses sometimes, right? And so, yeah, it's true. Like a lot of David's life is encouraging, uh, but then there's David, like, like you, you understand that there's David the shepherd. It's encouraging, right? There's David the king, the poet, the man who's after God's own heart. But in this story, David breaks like half of the Ten Commandments and all of that in just like one day. Like he's coveting, he's committing adultery, he's murdering, he's lying. And and I know this ain't the David that we know from Sunday school. Like this is the David who doesn't address his baby monsters. And because he doesn't address these things while they're small, they grow to Sam's Club proportions, right? It's like you can't just buy one. Like he's got the whole like box of baby monsters that follow him from this point in this story. And, you know, the first baby monster that he doesn't deal with began with him being lethargic. Now, to be lethargic means that you're characterized by laziness or you have a lack of energy. And David here in this part of the story was chilling, right? He should have been out in the field killing, but he was chilling. And in verse 1, it tells us that, that it was that time of the year that kings go out to battle. But David, the king David, stayed home. And in other words, like, he's not where he's supposed to be. And if he was, then he would have never seen Bathsheba if he would have been out to battle. But he wasn't out there. He was sitting around exposing himself to temptation that he didn't even need to be exposed to. And I know you might be thinking, well, maybe David had a good reason to stay behind, Pastor. Like, like, like maybe there was a good, well... I know if you're thinking that, let me show you what the Message Bible says, because the Message Bible tells me something uh, that the normal translation won't tell us. And, and then after I read it, you can tell me if he had a good enough reason or not to stay home from the battle. Here's what it says in verse 2, the Message Translation. It says, One late afternoon, David got up from taking his nap and was strolling on the roof of the palace. Now, he was taking a nap. Like, that was his reason for not going to battle. And and trust me, this is not no anti-vacation sermon because the Bible clearly tells us that it was the springtime. It was the time for when kings go out to battle. This means David had a whole season to chill. He had a season to recover, recuperate, recalibrate, however you want to put it. But David decides, you know what, I'm going to take a break. And when it was time to go back to work, he didn't get back to work. He stayed broken, right? He stayed on his break. And so now at this point of the story, David is 50 years old. He's been king for about 20 years. And before that, God called him as king, but he wasn't really recognized as king yet. And, and he, was, he was anointed, but not recognized officially. And I think that's how it often works, because God, God often works like that. Like he'll, he'll put dreams in our hearts for what is going to happen in our lives, but then he puts us in times of adversity to see if we are after the blessing or the blesser to see if we're capable of handling the kind of blessing also that he wants to give us. And so David is anointed as king, uh, and then his life gets more and more complicated and more complex, more difficult, which I believe happens over and over throughout Scripture and our lives as well. It's not just limited to the Scriptures, right? Because even as I look back on our time as pastors here at The Experience, there's never really been a time where there was a great time of blessing without it also being a time of challenge, difficulty, and humility. And sometimes what God does is he allows for us to go through these thorn in the flesh type seasons uh, to really keep us dependent on who he is and what he's able to do. And so on our part, we got to keep going out to battle and we got to keep embracing difficult things. And because, you know, you can't you can't rely on your comfort zones because comfort zones don't really keep you safe. Comfort. All that does is keep you small. All right. And so. David should have been going out to battle, but he's like, y'all go, I'm going to stay because I need a nap. And so David, again, is where he shouldn't be, chilling on the roof when he should be killing on the battlefield. And we got to learn to move with the seasons. We got to get to the field when it's time to go. We got to keep advancing. We got to keep depending on God, keep fighting for those who don't know Jesus yet. We got to still be willing to be uncomfortable, to always walk by faith, to be big givers and to trust God to do more and more. We got to keep inviting our friends to church. I, I, I mean, don't just come to church and get your little blessing and then go back to a normal life. It's like we got to keep agitating. We got to keep, you know, moving things, stretching our faith. And, and we can't be content with what God has done in our past. And so I pray that this really is your heart, because if you're not actively moving forward in God, you're going to automatically start sliding backwards. There was a British missionary to China by the name of Hudson Taylor, and he said this. He said, unless there is an element of risk in our exploits for God, then there's no need for faith. You know, when, when you live a life where you don't need faith and you're not trusting God, what you're doing is you're nursing your baby monster 
to growth. And so David was lethargic. Temptation shows up. And then as a result of his of him being lethargic, he's now lenient. So he's on the roof. He shouldn't have been there, but he's there. And verse 2 tells us that he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And the scripture says she was beautiful to behold, right? Now, there's these two words that I want to point out here. And that's, the word is that he saw and behold, saw and behold. And, 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 and there's, here's the difference between these two words. When you see something, it simply means, you know what, I noticed it. Right. David saw a woman naked bathing. He saw he noticed it. That's natural. It's natural for us to. Hey, look, we got eyes. You know, we were not blind. I saw something. OK, I noticed it. But then the Bible says that she was too beautiful to behold. So he was beholding her now. And the word behold means to stare or to gaze or to focus on. And so he saw her. But then he was like, man, I can't stop looking at her. And that's two totally different things. Now, when he saw her, that wasn't a sin. The, the devil always wants you to feel like, you know, being tempted is a sin because, you know, he knows that whenever that first domino falls, then the second one is going to fall a whole lot easier. Right. And then it, the rest will gain momentum as they continue to fall. So like like, for example, like you can have all this willpower to stay on a diet. Right. And we're talking about dominoes, one falling right after that, because it was the, the moment the first one falls, hey, it's just it's the domino effect after that. Right. So. We have this willpower to stay on a diet, but but once you break your diet, or like like for example, uh, I don't know if you do this, but whenever I go on a diet, like that one time every five years, uh, I like to have a cheat day, right? And here's the problem with cheat days for me is that uh, the moment I set aside for me a cheat day, it's easier for me to have a cheat weekend, right? So a cheat day turns into a weekend. A cheat weekend all of a sudden became a cheat week because I mean after all I've been dieting for three weeks. I deserve to have a cheat week, right? But that's that's the thing about letting the dominoes fall, right? So being tempted, that's not a sin. And feeling like you could do something wrong, it's not wrong. It's only wrong when you take the bait. But here's the thing. God always gives you a choice. You always have a choice, right? David saw her, and he could have looked away. First of all, the choice was like he was supposed to be in battle, but okay, he messed up on that choice now he saw her the choice was you ain't got to keep looking look away but he doesn't he chooses to behold to dwell to focus on right which allows now his baby monster of of being lethargic to to grow into temptation and, and it turns into now he he gives into that temptation right and and here's the thing about sin is that sin is always going to be about what you cannot have in the moment Sin is never going to reach a point to where it says, you know what, that's enough, Rallo. Like, you've sinned enough. You ain't got to sin no more. Nope, sin is always going to want more, right? And David's leniency allows his sin to grow. And now he's having sex with this woman. But here, here's God, you know, continuing to try to give him opportunities for him to stop, for him to not do what he's about to do, right? Because David asks about her, right? He says, hey, uh, anybody know who this woman is down there taking a bath? And someone's like, yep, I know who that is. That's Bathsheba. That's Eliam's daughter. That's Uriah's wife. And David's like, oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Why? Because David knew, like, he knew Uriah, right? Uriah was one of David's most loyal men who had been risking his life for David since before he was even king. So then David again, has the choice to say, man, that's, that's, my, that's my boy's wife. Like, I'm going to leave her alone. But no, what does he do? He chooses to send for her. She shows up. One thing leads to another because David is lenient. And so his sin grows into full-blown adultery. Now, I love how author Eugene Peterson put it. He said, he said this. Let me read it for you. David didn't feel like a sinner when he sent for Bathsheba. He felt like a lover. David didn't feel like a sinner when he sent for Uriah. He felt like a king. The subtlety of sin is that it does not feel like sin when we are doing it. See, the truth is just that sin does not always feel like sin when you're in it. It often feels right. It feels good in the moment. Like, man, I should be doing this more often. But the nature of sin is that it's deceitful. Sin lies to you. And it, it, it causes, in, or I should tell, I should say, uh, better put, it focus you, focuses you on the pleasure of, of the moment and it downplays any possible consequence that is attached to the sin that you're in so david sleeps with bathsheba he sends her home she's pregnant now and it's not uriah so what what does david do david's like oh my god i got this woman pregnant i feel so bad let me call my pastor and let me come clean let me tell him you know what i did and we can turn to god in prayer and i can own up to my sin uh that would have been nice but that's not what david does 
David, instead of like coming clean, he shifts into damage control. He's like, man, how do I control the narrative in this situation, right? So what he does is he calls for Uriah to come home. Uriah shows up, but he doesn't go to his own home. Uriah goes to David's house, and he asks David, okay, king, what can I do for you? And David's like, Uriah, what I need you to do, because, like, you've been such a great, you know, man, you've been my boy. Like, you've been, you've had my back since day one. Go home and be with your wife. Like, go and sleep with her. And, and because he's thinking, you know what, if he sleeps with her, then Uriah can think, well, the baby's his. But here's the thing about Uriah. Uriah, is, is, he's honorable. He's a fighter and he's honorable. He's like, King, my brothers are in battle right now. How can I go and Netflix and chill with my wife knowing that my brothers are dying on the battlefield? So instead of going home, Uriah sleeps on the, on the porch of David's house on the front porch. And so David, he, he's, I mean, he's sneaky. He's, he's doing everything he can to, to, again, control the narrative in this situation. So he tries to get Uriah so drunk so that way he can go home and sleep with his own wife. But Uriah... The thing about Uriah is that he's more honorable drunk than David is sober. And that is amazing to me, right? But And so Uriah decides, you know, I'm going to stay here at David's. I don't care how drunk I am. He's he's chilling. So David has to think of another way to control the damage that he's done. Uh, verse 14, he says, In the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. So it was while Joab besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the people of the servants of David fell, and Uriah, the Hittite, died also. Because David is in damage control, like he has this honorable man killed, and the Bible tells us in, in verse 26 and 27 that like that Bathsheba heard that Uriah was, was dead, and so she started to mourn for her husband. And when her mourning was over, that David went and sent for her and said, hey, you know, have Bathsheba come here. And so she became his wife and she had his son. But then the Bible says that, that, that the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And so David, on the other hand, like he thinks he got away with it. You know, he's he's man, I'm coming out on top. But really, if you read the rest of the story here, uh, he goes through a really hard year or, or a year of absolute misery and he writes in Psalms 51 that this was this was a period in his life where it felt like everything dried up. All, he was like in a spiritual drought within his soul. And he says, the, the deeds that I've done, they haunt me day and night. And like, he's just in absolute agony and misery emotionally, spiritually. And, and sin, the thing about it is that it lies to you. It's always going to lie to you. And, and not only that, it's going to pay you the wages of sin, the Bible says, is death. And Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7 tells us that, that bread gained by deceit is sweet, but afterwards your mouth is like it's filled with gravel. Like there's a consequence to your sin. There's a, con a consequence for you gaining things by lying, by trying to control narratives. And tragically, it's his, it's his kids that really suffer the most. Like, like they, they have, you know, his son, this son dies and his kids, I mean, they go through all kinds of suffering and... Of course, David is going to be forgiven because God has grace and he forgives David. And in the end, you know, when we stand before God, it's not going to be about our deeds or your deeds. It's going to be about Jesus' deeds. But there are still consequences that show up in the life of those who choose to do sin deliberately. And this is how it is in David's life. Then, then David enters into this most, I, th I think, poisonous, most dangerous period of his life where he becomes uh, pious. And being pious is when you're so full of deceit on the inside, but on the outside you act like everything's perfect. Like, oh, look, I'm just, I'm the most holiest of holies because David was still going to church. He was still acting churchy, still going through the motions of religion and giving an offering and doing all these things. But the truth is that he had a wall between him and God. Like, he, there was no intimacy between him and God. It's as if his friendship between him and God was gone, and, and he wasn't drawing closer to God. Now, all this was his choice. And so what happened to David is what happens to us as a result of us not choosing to have this relationship with God is that, you know, he became, and we have the potential to as well become Pharisees. When, 
uh, when there's no inward life, when the, this this is what it means to be a Pharisee, is like I have no relationship with God. I just know all the rules, but I don't have any of the love. And so when there's no inward life, but you're still going through the motions, like it's easy to have this great sense of piousness. The problem with that is that often th it's those people who are the most judgmental. Those are the ones who are secretly the most hypocritical. As a matter of fact, Jesus put it this way. He says it's usually the person who has like a plank sticking out of their eye. Right? He, and can you imagine somebody who has like this, this two by 12 sticking out of your eye, right? And it's just like, oh, it's way out there. And then they, have, they come to you with the audacity to say, hey, you got some sawdust in your eye. And like, bruh, like you could build a house with all the wood that's coming out of your eye. And you're telling me about my sawdust? Like, okay, get a grip, son. Like, for real. Like, you better watch yourself, right? But watch what God does, okay? In chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. Of the same book. Here's what he says. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little lamb, which he had bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and his children. It ate of his own food and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare for the one, for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David heard this story, right? And he's, his, the Bible says his anger was greatly aroused against this man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this sh shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Then David said, then, excuse me, Nathan said to David, uh, That's you, bruh. You are that man. And David, see, he was he was already, I mean, he was in his piousness, right? He was living out of this judgmental spirit. He wasn't seen clearly, so he says, I'm going to kill the guy who killed this this man's pet, man. Like, this this little lamb, like, it was like his daughter. I'm going to kill him because, you know, like, whoa, hey, wait a minute, David. Like, what really what was going on it was David's own heart was speaking to himself. And Nathan just allowed him to see himself in the mirror, if you will. And so David fell on his knees and he repented at that moment. So my question to you today is, how can we avoid this from happening to us? Because if it happened to David, let me tell you, it can happen to us too. And see, when David was writing, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, he wasn't thinking that one day he was going to ignore God for a year or have an affair with uh, another man's wife and uh, much less get her pregnant and then kill the husband to cover it up. Like he he wasn't planning on ignoring God for a whole year when he was writing the Lord is my shepherd. But but, you know, like he, he did and he was still showing up to church. And I, I, I can imagine if you would have been there to ask David as he was writing the Lord is my shepherd. He was like, I and mean, you would have said, hey, David, you think that one day you might uh, have the. Uh, the wherewithal or the the audacity to sleep with another man's wife and get her pregnant and then kill him like you think you could ever do that uh and david would be like no way there's no way i could ever do that right the lord is my shepherd i have everything i need right and so part of my point is this right and this is where i'll finish i'm, I'm really close to the end is is that none of us are immune to temptation okay any of us could have done what David has done or we could do what David has done or worse. So so the question again is how do we avoid such a thing? Well, I want to give you three things today and then we'll be out on how to avoid being like David in this sense, okay, to where he did all of these things that he shouldn't have been doing and allowed for his baby monsters to take over his life in this moment. Number one, be open to conviction. You got to be receptive to the Holy Spirit and to his voice and to his unction and to, to his direction. Why? Because no doubt God gives David chance. Like he gave him chances to do the right thing. As a matter of fact, the scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that the temptations in your life, they're, they're no different from what anybody else experiences. And, but he tells us that God is faithful, though, that, that God is not going to allow for the temptation to be more than you can stand. So he tells us that when you're tempted, he's going to show you a way out. Why? Because he wants you to endure. He wants you to make it. God is not out here for, so, so that you could fail and go to hell. Like, that's not his plan. Right? He says that when you're tempted, he's going to show you a way out so you can endure. God is going to show you. The thing is, you got to remember to do your job 
and be looking and be willing to be open and receive that conviction of God. Number two, you have to keep short accounts with God. Got to keep short accounts with God. In other words, don't let things pile up when it comes to you and God and, and the sin that you've entered into, right? Like you ever, you ever waited long, uh, too long to balance your checkbook, right? Like if you wait too long to go through the receipts, man, you're, you're going to get overwhelmed and start to look at certain things like, man, I don't even know what this one's for. Like it's all faded. I don't even have a date for this. And, and what happened is that you allowed everything to pile up. But if you keep your accounts short, Meaning, if you go through and balance your accounts on a daily basis and deal with them when they're fresh, it's a whole lot easier to do, right? And the truth is, we all fall short of God's glory, right? And so when you do, run to God. It's not if you do, it's when you do. Run to God. Run to His presence and ask Him and thank Him for forgiveness that is yours. Don't let, don't let that sin and unforgiveness pile up. Keep short accounts with God, okay? And number three... I want you to have the right friends. Have the right friends. David had two friends in this story. One of them was Nathan. The other one was Joab. And let me show you the difference because Joab knew exactly what David was doing this whole time. But Joab helped David to cover it up. And I know you're probably thinking, it's like, man, that's, that's a real homie, man. Like, that's my partner in crime right there. Exactly. That was a partner in crime, not a PIC partner in Christ. That's a PIC partner in crime, okay? And the thing about Joab is that he never let David forget it. The Bible says that from this, this moment on, Joab was uncontrollable by David. Why? Because can you imagine the king saying, hey, I need you to obey this. And he's like, man, you try to tell me what to do. Like, you got this woman pregnant and killed her husband. You trying to tell me how to live my life? Yeah, right, David. Like you trying to tell me to go to, like to do, you know, don't drink yet. You over here getting this man drunk out here, you know, the whole time trying to, you know, plot your whole little story here to, to have things go your way. Joab was uncontrollable by David. Right? Nathan now, David's other friend. Nathan helped David to see his sin. And he helped him to come to God in prayer. He didn't help David cover it up. He helped him conquer it. So what do your friends look like? You got Joab's or do you got Nathan's? You have people in your life who help you sin? Or do you have people in your life who are willing to lovingly confront you when you're making decisions that are uh, going to harm you? Right? Let me, you know, and, and you know, I, I, real quick, let me give you a bonus, a number four, if you will, because you've already stuck it out this far with me. So I'll give you one more as a bonus. For the rest who logged out already, they're going to miss out. They're not going to have a number four, but you, do, you get to have one today. Number four, be the right friend. We also got to be and speak like Nathan, right? It's not, you know, like, yeah, let's have some Nathans in our life, but let's also be like Nathan. We got to learn to, to speak to people about their sin, but to do it with grace, to do it with truth, with love, with some honesty, and also with a broken heart, right? Knowing that, man, it breaks my heart to see that what you're doing is not it, man. You know, because Nathan didn't rush into the room and, and point fingers at David and be like, you perverted, scummy sinner, like, God, man, God... You hope you go to, like, no, nah, he didn't do none of that, right? He was, the Bible shows us that Nathan was winsome. Like, he knew how to speak to David so in such a way that, that, that David wouldn't, like, pick up his guard and his shield. So we got to also be like Nathan, speak like Nathan. We got we to gotta live like Nathan and, and be the right friend to people around us. And I pray that these four things will help us to uh, kill the baby monsters in our lives and to not let them grow big enough to try to take us out. And, um, you know, in case you're wondering about how Billy's story turned out, uh, his mom says, so I guess dragons are real. And Billy says, but why, why did it have to get so big? And I thought it was interesting, the mom's response, because she says, I don't know, son. I guess it just wanted to be noticed. And um, if we will notice, just take the time to notice the baby monsters in our own lives, then they won't be able to grow. Why, Pastor? Like, why do you say that? Well, because sin grows best whenever it's left unchecked. And when it comes to the sin in your life, I pray that you choose to no longer be lethargic or lenient because then you won't have to worry about damage control and have to live a life of piousness. Instead, I pray that you be open to conviction, that you run to God as soon as sin happens and keep your account short with him. And I pray that you would have the right friends 
and that you would also learn to be the right friend.